Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. If you're anything like me, you might love a good night drive, but hate the actual driving in the night part. Shout out to my partner, Ryan, for always being the night driver. For me, I'm always afraid something's going to dart out at me or fly into the middle of the road. I worry that I'll just miss parts of the road entirely and fly off whatever road it is I'm on. And really, I just hate how hard it is to see anything. Luckily for me, I've never actually been confronted with this, so it just remains one of those silly fears. For others, well, at least for some others, these night drives have given birth to new fears. Fears they didn't even know they were supposed to have until they presented themselves. Sometimes, right in the middle of the road. So, let's get started. Shall we? When I came to the States about 15 years ago, one of my first jobs was working at a public pool. I would always work alone as my shift was the overnight or after hours shift. I was responsible for cleaning the building's major touch points and for cleaning the pool itself. This experience happened just past 11 p.m., so the pool and the building, they'd been closed for over two hours. I moved on from cleaning the floors in the pool area to the floors within the locker rooms. While in the female locker room, I hear the very distinct sound of children's laughter, followed by a large splash. Panic fills my body as I go into worst-case scenario mode. There were still children within the building, and now they were inside the pool. I drop the mop and make my way across the wet floor as quickly as I can. I rush through the doors, and I see that the pool is calm. Even more, it's still covered. The area is silent for a moment. I walk over to the pool cover to take a peek underneath, make sure no one is trapped or hiding. And as I do this, I hear the sound of little wet feet running around the pool area. I sit up, and then I stand. Then do a 360-degree look around, only to see nothing. No one. I stood there quiet, almost in disbelief of what was happening. I turned back to the locker rooms, slowly walk in and listen. Again, I hear laughter, children's laughter. It's fading in and out just before it gets quiet entirely. I continued with my shift and then I got out of there. This was the first time I had that experience, but it continued for the whole year that I worked there. It was always the same. Laughing, splashing, running. I had decided that all those noises and commotion were coming from the pool area itself, as I had no other incidents in any other area. Since I was on the late shift, I never saw any other employees, and unfortunately, I didn't get to ask many questions. I looked into the place after I decided I was going to share this story. But even to this day, I don't see any negative history. I don't show anything that points to ghosts. So, was this pool experiencing some sort of time loop? Whatever that means. Or, I mean, is it even possible that these voices were that of children ghosts? I think about this experience often, and 15 years later, I'm really still not sure what to make of it. A woman stepped into the road as I was driving home on the 109 to Tahola in the fall of 2003. It was one of the most nerve-wracking events I've ever experienced in my life. I've had deer jump into my windshield before and woken up in the hospital in Aberdeen wondering what the fuck happened. But not this. 
trying to avoid her, I almost took my car off the embankment. Like, close. One tire hanging off the edge close. When the car stopped, I ripped it in reverse to get all the tires back on the ground, and then I threw it in park and jumped out. Leaving the door open, I ran to the front of the car. Nothing resembled an impact of any kind on the hood. I got on my hands and knees and looked under the car, even getting out my phone to use as a flashlight. I was relieved to see that I didn't hit anyone. I don't know how I didn't, but replaying it in my head, I didn't remember feeling anything hit my car, nor an underbump. I got up off the ground and again, replaying it in my head, the joy that I felt for my luck became rage. Rage that someone would roll the dice with not only their lives, but someone else's in the process by walking up this two-lane highway at night. I shouted, Hello? Are you fucking serious? Into the darkness. I could smell the rubber from my tires on the road, from me slamming on my brakes. The chemicals and the ozone made me even more aware and angry of what had just happened. I may be 5'4", but I'm from the res, and I've knocked out bitches way bigger than this chick who just tried to step out in front of my car. I should also mention my emotions were already pretty high that night. I'd gotten into a fight with my boyfriend that night, actually. That's where I was coming from. So I was on a short fuse and not afraid to deliver the smoke to anyone who wanted it that night. In retrospect, I hoped to control my anger better, but in that moment, I didn't care. Again, I shouted, Hello? With no reply. So, to show insistence upon not being disrespected, I retrieved a baseball bat from the back seat of my car, and then I walked to the edge of my headlight's visibility, telling her that she's going to wish the car got her instead of me. I stood there for a good minute, listening. After a moment, I realized that the quiet night had gotten even quieter. The nighttime score had settled down. No crickets... No sound in the distance from the beach or other homes. No cars. I told myself this was normal. And that I just didn't step out of my car every night. And that's why this all seemed so strange. And so I stood there for a bit. No longer calling out, just looking around. The cold road, blackened under twilight, was eerie to be in. Feeling the weight of my irrationality. I quickly turned around and started walking back to my car. And that's when I hear footsteps on the pavement, sprinting towards me from behind. My terrified reaction? To scream while turning around, swinging the baseball bat with every ounce of strength I have. So hard that I lose its grip. And send it sailing into the dark. I could hear the wood hit the road once before it goes through branches and off the embankment. For a second time in this night, I have not made expected contact and it's like my brain switches into flight mode. It feels like my body is controlling itself as my legs sprint me back to the car. And in there, I hit the gas pedal so hard that it almost goes through the floor. I was shaking the rest of the way home, looking frantically in my rearview mirror to see if someone was following me, and honestly even looking to see if someone was in my back seat. I had to drive this route often, and I'd never had anything like that happen to me before. When I got home, my gramps asked me why I was so out of breath from driving a car. I considered not even getting into it, but instead, I just sat down and told my gramps about it. He didn't even react, only responding, saying, Oh, Lena, you saw a misp. I truly wasn't sure what he was talking about. Was he saying that I had just seen mist outside and was scaring myself? I told him I knew that it wasn't mist or fog, and he sort of laughed while repeating slower. Misp. A transformer, hun. This didn't clear my confusion, and he rolled his eyes playfully, saying that my mother doesn't tell me anything anymore, does she? He then explained, a misp, or a transformer, 
is known by many different names among many different Pacific Northwest tribes. For the Quinault, we refer to it by the name Misp or Musp, depending who you ask. And according to my gramps, they can be real tricksters, shifting from being to being, altering their surroundings sometimes. Are they bad luck? I asked him, naturally, I had to know. No, not bad luck, just tricksters. Looks like they got you pretty good, huh? And then he laughed. I told the old man that wasn't funny. I could have been run off the road. But you weren't, Lena. Remember that, okay? I left it at that because ultimately, he was right. I was okay. I've driven the 109 many times since, as my family still lives out that way. But I haven't had any future encounters. Curious, how many people out there have had similar experiences? I hope this story brings you as many chills as it did me as I remembered it, typing it out. Sometime when I was in my early 20s, between the years 2009 and 2010 to be exact, I took a vacation from my home in the south of Japan to a sleepy little seaside town called Shimabara. Needless to say, Shimabara is a town that is friendly, but the air is quite heavy even without knowing the magnitude of history beforehand. It's also very, very, very old. For this instance, I will tell you, it was summer, and we were on our way, walking, to a site that my mother was excited to see. The Nahanzo statue. It's a Buddha in a reclining position. It's not the biggest, but my mother, being a Buddhist, on top of a lover of history... I'd been looking forward to it this entire weekend that we were staying there. Admittedly, for the same reasons I was too. The phone GPS I was using to get us there took us through an open strip mall, littered with freshwater springs that had cups for guests to take drinks, which was a reprieve, considering the humid weather. And into the temple, surrounded by a graveyard, is where we went. Now... It's not unusual for temples and graveyards to coexist, especially in the countryside. They're not common, but not unusual. It is unusual, however, to build a statue of worship or enlightenment in the middle of a graveyard. That alone began to set a very uneasy feeling in me, but not enough that I was very alarmed. The Nahanzo itself was at the top of a hill which surprisingly was also the center of the graveyard. The entire slope up to it was surrounded by family plots, with the newest and biggest at the bottom, and getting older toward the top. Some of the graves at the top were so old that they'd lost whatever shape they were supposed to have, looking like rounded, rotted teeth, with their carvings either taken over by moss or washed away completely into unintelligible messes. Now, call me morbid, but I found far more interest in the graves than the Nahanzo by this point. Leaving my parents to take pictures and admire the bronze work, I wandered off to the steps just below to see the graves. If I looked over the crest of the hill, I could see the city stretching out and slivers of the ocean and the horizon. I didn't know why, but there was something beautiful but foreboding about watching the sea. I decided to look instead at the graves and try to see if there was anything at all that I could read. As I'm studying the barest scratches that pass themselves as family names, I notice movement to the right side of me, on the side that is open towards the sea, and coming down from the Nahanzo. I turn my head just enough to make out what it is, and quickly keep my head bowed with reverence. There's a monk leading a procession of what looked to be three mourners. 
the one at the front carrying the urn of ashes. The mourners are all dressed in black, heads hung low, and I have enough respect in me to move a little more to the opposite side and keep my head bowed to show respect for them. I failed to notice there was no chanting. There was no sound at all, no footsteps against the very much stone pathway. The monk's sandals, by all reason, should make noise. Geta are not stealthy by any means. But, by my reasoning, mourners and a monk aren't unheard of in a graveyard, and when enough space between them and myself to be deemed respectable has passed, I move back to what I was doing, and I find my gaze wandering down the rows of graves I'm in. Every plot is old. Some are even older, less identifiable than the one I'm examining. I look back and darkness catches my eye behind the grave. Almost thinking I was blocking a mourner somehow, I raise just my eyes and see, well, it. What gender it was, I can't tell you. I can't tell you it was human, though its body faded somewhere around the thighs, so there was no feet. Its hair was long, past the shoulders, and stringy, very black. Its clothes, though, honestly, it didn't even have the folds of clothes so much as appear that everything from its neck down was simply a black shadow in its former human shape. The nose was bulbous, with the ridge having a small bump, but mostly, I remember the eyes. They were wide with rage and hate. Its head hung low, as if being forced to bow to someone it loathed. And I could see the whites all around, such dark, hateful eyes. I glanced down the rows of old graves and saw every one of them had the same shadow. It watched me as I sidestepped out of the row and into the main path, where my mother found me. She was already looking at me strangely, asking me why I looked so pale. She likely thought it was one of my many health issues. I, instead of answering, asked her about the funeral procession that passed me by. Her answer still gives me chills. What funeral? There's been no one here, not even the priest. I immediately told her about what I saw, and she responded by telling me that we were leaving right then, and that until we got out of the temple grounds, I wasn't allowed to speak to anyone. I obeyed. Now, here's the historical fun part. If you're old enough to remember the 90s, then Shimabara might ring a bell. It's the location of Mount Unzin, a very much still active volcano that erupted back then. It isn't the first time the town had been blasted by the pyroclastic flow of the volcano either. It's erupted at least three times since towns were built around it, with the worst of it during the Edo period, where the eruption not only destroyed the towns, but caused a mega tsunami that swept many out into the Ariac Sea where bodies would wash ashore as far as Kumamoto. Summer is regarded as a time where the veil between spirit and physical begins to wane, with the thinnest being in August. For my town, other places might celebrate on a different day or different month when the Festival Oban, or Day of the Dead, takes place. It's popular to tell ghost stories during the summer, as it's believed the chill you can get will help you with the heat but too many, and you'll summon a ghost. For my entire life, I've always been very sensitive to the paranormal. It seems actually quite normal to me, and there are very few things that I will claim do not exist in reality with any certainty. Much of that has to do with my experiences as a child. When I was still in my crib, I must have been no older than 18 months. 
My mother told me that she would watch me through the crack of the door because I was always talking to someone. It was always something that happened in the morning before she'd go scoop me up from my crib and begin our day. Every day, I was having a nonsense baby conversation with someone in the corner of the room. When she went in, she felt like there was something in the room, besides her and myself. She said that this presence or entity was not bad, that it couldn't be bad, because she got a feeling that the presence was there for me in a loving way. She felt safe because I was being watched over by a good energy. Sometimes she would feed me in a high chair in the living room, and according to her, I would turn towards the room suddenly as if someone called my name. She felt that presence from the other room. This is something that she's told me about throughout my life, but I never shared with her my own experiences before or after learning about these things. I have memories of being in my crib, which in itself is pretty strange. Most people don't start remembering things until around three, and before that is sort of a fog of forgetfulness for most of us. But my nightly experiences in this crib are clear to me. So clear that it's as if they happened yesterday. And I'm 40. I would see fractals, a rotating light. And I could see images of people sort of arching over me in the darkness. Being lit up on its own as if being played on a long curved movie screen. I could see... How do I explain this? What I perceive only now to be stars. Like a moving universe of pinpoint lights that slowly moved around me. When I was a baby, and I really was literally a baby, this entertained me to no end, and I could watch it in awe until I fell asleep. Sometimes, something would wake me up in the night, something in the darkness. It would touch or tickle my feet. I remember looking at my feet wondering without fear what or who this is. Every time this happened, I saw a hand or an arm, pale, whitish, reaching out to my feet, the way anyone would to try to play around with something cute, like a kitten or a puppy or a baby. My crib was lit very dimly by some light, but the rest of my room was pitch black, except for the rectangular outline of the closed door. The light I could see from the hallway of our apartment I would look for the person attached to this arm, but the rest of the arm went into the darkness, and all I could see was the arm. I would often think, I'm tired, stop that, in whatever way a baby thinks of that, without words. And the hand would retract into the darkness. I never felt afraid. Maybe that's because this being was indeed good, like my mother said. Or maybe it was at a point where I hadn't learned what fear was yet. I had no reason to be afraid. The world was yet filled with loving beings in the day, in the night, in the real world, and the ethereal. My mother recently told me that she never told my father about these experiences. I certainly never got to tell him anything of what I experienced. Before they divorced... She went to tell him about a strange thing that used to happen with her and me in our old apartment. Oh, the thing that was in his room? Yeah, there was something in there. I felt it too, he admitted. When I was in the seventh grade, I took a road trip with my best friend and her family to Canada. We made the drive from southern Idaho, so it wasn't a super long trip, but it did take us through the night to get to our destination. And I stayed awake the whole time. As we passed through what I can only guess was Washington State, 
Some of the roads became more twisty and turny than I was used to. Sometimes I get car sick on rides like that, so my friend's mom switched seats with me for a while, allowing me to sit in the front seat where the sickness wasn't as intense. It was starting to get dark around this time, and the roads that were once just twisty were now very dark. To distract myself from this fact, I'd asked my friend if she wanted to play I Spy in the dark. She agreed. This game started out, as you can imagine, in the dark, pretty uneventful. Just a few things were actually illuminated by headlights. The dividers in the road, the trees off the road, and the occasional road sign. After deciding there were only so many things we could spy, we decided to call it quits. And then... It all happened so fast. Seconds, not minutes. It was just as the car started to get quiet again. I'm looking down at my lap where I have a collection of CDs in a case. Then I feel my friend's dad slam on the brakes. And I look over and I see that he's beginning to jolt the steering wheel towards me, to the right. As he does this, I hear my friend start to scream. And in the same moment, I looked up at the road to see something I had never seen in my life. It wasn't a person because their feet weren't touching the ground, but the shape of the thing in the middle of the road was that of someone wearing a robe, a large hooded jacket. No one was screaming any longer, but everyone was looking slightly behind us in the direction of what we had just seen. It was so dark that no one could see anything, but I could swear that it was still there. My friend's dad takes inventory of the car to make sure that we're all okay, and then he keeps checking the rearview mirror. He's about to say something when we hear a large crashing sound, a sound so large it actually shook the car, and suddenly debris were hitting the car from unknown locations. My friend's mom starts to raise her voice, asking her dad to please start the car. He starts the car, but then he pauses. He physically turns around, and then he asks my friend's mom to grab the flashlight from the back. We're all looking backwards behind us at this point, and we can't clearly see much, but the taillights offer a glow of the road behind us. Something's in the middle of it, but it's not the same figure. Suddenly, much more light is available, and it's clear that there's a giant boulder in the middle of the road, almost exactly where we saw the figure. After the initial shock wore down, my friend's parents called the police to report the incident. When her dad got off the phone, my friend asked, why didn't you tell them about the man? Her parents looked at each other, and after what felt like a long time, they finally said that they weren't sure they saw a man. We both chimed in at the same time, explaining what we saw. They listened, but when the police arrived, they once again left it out of their story. So we never got real validation to what we saw, but that doesn't mean we didn't see it. I'm not so sure what exactly it was, but for some reason, the way everything unfolded, it's hard to tell if it was there to help us or hurt us. Well, everyone, that concludes tonight's episode. But thank you for tuning in, and thank you to everyone for sharing your story. And if you have stories like these, I'd love to share them. Send them to me, Amanda, darkest hour at gmail.com. And check out our subreddit, The Darkest Hour, YT. If you love The Darkest Hour, and you never want it to end, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Stay spooky. Stay spooky.